at 6.30 p.m. If you're interested in being a host, you can stop by Next Steps today. Thanks again for being with us today. You can stay up to date with anything that's going on at Real Life by visiting us online or by downloading the Real Life app by searching My RLC in your device's app store. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay connected with us throughout the week. Have an amazing week. Welcome those that are watching online this morning. We're so glad that you're with us today. And um, today is kind of in between series, so if you're new here, uh, just let you know we're kind of in between a series time. And uh, today we're going to continue. I'm doing a two-part series on the church. And uh, today we're going to talk about the Empowered Church, as today is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, we're going to share a little bit about that, because I feel like I've felt in my heart this past week, as we're talking about the church, that we have to understand the Holy Spirit's role in the church. Uh, regardless of what society has says, or maybe your church background, or maybe you've uh, experienced the Holy Spirit in a weird way, in a spooky way, I'm hoping today that I can teach you how to be supernaturally naturally to where it's not weird, it's not spooky, you understand what the Holy Spirit is, he's not an it, he's a person. Come on, I need you to talk to me this morning. He's a person, if, if, if you understand the, the Holy Spirit. Some of you may not, and I'm hoping today the, the, the Word of God will be able to explain to you on this Pentecost Sunday. And what Pentecost means, a lot of people think, well, that's a denomination. I'm going to show you what the word Pentecost means um, this morning, and it, just kind of break it down. Let's shut all of our experiences away this morning if we can, you know, no matter how we grew up, um, whether you grew up in a Pentecostal church, charismatic, or you grew up in a Baptist church or Presbyterian or Catholic, it doesn't matter. Um, you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves into your life. I know some on-fire Catholics that have the Holy Spirit and they're soul winners. I know some Baptist folks that are, on, it's not a denominational thing, right? We put it into categories and the Holy Spirit is not a denominational thing. He's the third person of the Trinity and he wants to live on the inside of you and he wants to move through your life. And so uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the empowered church today. Acts chapter 19, verse number one says this, when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So again, he's going to talk to the church of Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he, again, there's some disciples here in Ephesus, and Ephesus is one of the major uh, ports areas where Paul would visit. He started the church of Ephesus there. It's a very large church, and um, it's the church that he handed over to Timothy, about 100,000 people uh, during that time. And believe me, that's a lot of people, uh, 100,000 people. And uh, he handed over, and he said this. He said to the disciples, notice the word disciple. In other words, they were following Jesus. They had received Christ, they were experienced salvation, and then Paul is asking them about a second experience. He says this, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So here's what I want you to understand. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? The answer is yes. When you, when you say yes to Christ, the Holy Spirit is the one that makes you brand new. He's the one that comes in and makes your spirit a brand new, uh, a brand new spirit. And so they were confused in this moment. They didn't really understand the question. If you look at the back through the, the uh, history of this, is they said, "No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit." In other words, they weren't educated through revelation of what the Holy Spirit actually did when they said yes to Christ. And so there's confusion about the Holy Spirit. I believe there's confusion today about the Holy Spirit. I believe that, that confusion has come through our experiences. It's come through, um, uh, 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 maybe you've never been told about the Holy Spirit, and so you, like, you feel certain things. Maybe you've said yes to Christ, and, and like today, this morning, during worship, like you could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this room. And so you might ask yourself, well, that's kind of weird and kooky. Look, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna take all the kookiness out of this. Look at your neighbor and say, it ain't gonna be kooky. So look at your second neighbor who was your second choice and say, don't you be kooky. <laughs> Listen, I really believe that my opinion is this. There's been a lot of, there's been some bad packaging around the Holy Spirit. Um, and a lot of people don't reject the Bible when it comes to the Holy Spirit. They reject the packaging that people have used to talk about the Holy Spirit. Let me say that one more time, is because a lot of people have not rejected the Bible about the Holy Spirit, they've rejected the packaging that people have used to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not spirit weird. He's not a weird spirit. Jesus wasn't weird. And, and the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when I, when I leave, I'm going to leave you uh, one that's just like myself, and his, his name is the Holy Spirit. 
And he's going to come and he's going to lead you in all truth. He's going to guide you. He's going to make you powerful into witnesses. He didn't say he was going to make you weird. Jesus wasn't weird. How many know Jesus wasn't weird? You read your Bibles. There's no indication of weirdness with Jesus. There's a lot of love. There's a lot of compassion. There's a lot of grace. But there's also a lot of spirit-led moments. And we have to get back to the place as the church where we're living in spirit-led moments. The reason he went to the woman at the well was because the spirit drove him to that place. Come on, somebody. He read the woman's mail, not knowing her history. Let me say it like this because you might think, well, was he in her mailbox? Let me help you. (laughs) The Holy Spirit was speaking to Jesus about the woman's life, not with the intent to condemn her, but with the intent to restore her. And the woman was restored and became a soul winner and, read all, and, and began to lead Samaria to Jesus. And so I want you to understand something today, that the Holy Spirit empowers you to do things for him that you can't do without him. Whew. There's things that the Holy Spirit wants to do through your life that you can't do on your own, that it requires the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and when I look at the word spirit, you know, it says Holy Spirit. The word spirit in the Old Testament was the word ruach. I'll give you a little bit of fun on this memorial day. Everybody looks at his name and say, Ruach. That's a Ruach. It's, um, it's Old Testament, and it's, it's uh, the Hebrew for the word spirit. And it means wind. It means breath. It means a... Vi- <sighs> Did you hear that? It's breath. It's a violent exhal- uh, exhal- uh, ex- ex- exhalation. I can't even say the word. Blast of breath is what it means. It means breath. Amen. Holy Spirit is God's breath. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and with the empty, and was empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the breath of God was hovering over the waters. See, the breath of God and the, the, the Spirit of God is the, the manifester of Jesus' words. So when he said, let there be light, it was the Holy Spirit that took the Father's words, grabbed the hold of those words, and manifested them in the earth. The Holy Spirit is the manifester of Jesus. You see the Father? If you want to see the Father, look at Jesus. You want to see the Holy Spirit, look at Jesus. Right? If you, if you, want, to see, if you want to see how the Father operates, that's, that's Jesus. He, he operates. And so that, that's how the Father would operate. And so the, the, the word in the New Testament is the word pneuma. It means a current of air, a blast of breath, a strong breeze. Again, it's back to breath. John uh, 6.33 says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. And so when the Bible's talking about the breath of God or the spirit of God, he's talking about the breath of God. He's talking about the wind of God. He's talking talking about the internal breath of God. And so when we take the word Pentecost, you can't attach the meaning of modern day Pentecost with what the Bible actually means about Pentecost. Because we take a segment of what happened on Pentecost and forget the rest. We take what happens in Acts chapter uh, 2 verse number 2 and we talk about that experience. We talk about that experience more than we talk about what happened about 10 verses later as a result of that experience. See, don't tell me you had an experience of Acts chapter 2, verse number 2, if you're not a soul winner. Well, I do this, and I got the Holy Spirit. No, you don't. Not if you're not a soul winner. Because out of the experience of Acts chapter 2, what happened? Peter got up and declared, and 3,000 people got saved. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses, not not to just be funky. Not to be weird, right? And so it's, but, but, but the word Pentecost, again, which is today, it literally is the 50th day after the crucifixion. And Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, notice what it says. It says the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a day. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a day. It's not an experience, it's a day. Now, experience happened on that day, but we attach what happened on that day as the day. Pentecost is a day. And it says this, that, that literally, um, it's, Pentecost is not only a day, but it's a holiday. And uh, how many know we have holidays? We have Christmas and Easter, and we celebrate holidays. And uh, the Jewish folks, they, they celebrated holidays. And Pentecost was one of their three major holidays. They had, they had, they had about seven, but three major holidays that the Jewish uh, uh, folks focused on back then. And, and really what it is, is Pentecost was the fulfillment of, of, the, of, the, Pente- of, of the, the holiday Pentecost. And so, again, Jesus used holidays. I'm going to share with you these holidays. You didn't know you were going to come to church to learn about holidays, did you? Holidays. I'm going to share with you these holidays because they explain. Jesus used 
These holidays to explain or give a picture to the Jewish people what he wanted for them. He would take the, the, the Old Testament holidays, and, or he would take the Old Testament, excuse me, he would take the holidays and he would give them a picture of, of what he had for their life. And so Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 says this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus didn't say, I'm dealing, I'm getting rid of the Old Testament. Now, the law was the first five books and the prophets was majority of the rest of the Old Testament. And what Jesus came to do was fulfill them. He came to fulfill them. And so we don't, we don't do the practices of the Old Testament, right? Come on, because if we did, we'd have to sacrifice your lamb. That's, a, that's at the farm. Come on, somebody. That's what they did back then. They would sacrifice the lamb and they'd put it on the altar and we'd all be out there in the brazen altar, like this is not what we're doing, okay? We don't do the practices of the Old Testament, we do do the principles of the Old Testament. There are principles of the Old Testament and Jesus came to fulfill the picture of the Old Testament. He came to give us a picture. And so I'm gonna give you these three major holidays and I'm gonna tell you what happens when the Holy Spirit empowers the church. The first holiday was Passover. And Passover, uh, it's, it's when the Hebrew nation, what they were celebrating in this holiday was when the Hebrew nation or the children of Israel came out of Egypt. You know, they were in 400 years of slavery. They had went down, there was a famine in the land. They had went down to Egypt and Pharaoh uh, got a hold of them and put them into captivity. And they were there for 400 years into captivity. And what would happen, though, is, is, is Moses, uh, uh, the, God wanted the people out of there, and, and Moses was raised up as a deliverer. Before that Moses thing happened, that, that God started to shake Pharaoh, and he'd send plagues. You guys remember the plagues in the Old Testament? He'd send plagues. But before he'd send the plagues, God really wanted the people to be free. And so he, what would happen is Pharaoh was requiring the, 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 the death of the firstborn child. And that would be like the sacrifice, if you will, of the firstborn. Well, God didn't want that to happen. And so before the plagues, he would announce to his people that if you sacrifice a lamb and you take the blood of the lamb and you put it on the floor, uh, on the, on the, on your doorpost of your home, that when the death angel comes during the plagues, that it will pass over your house. Hence the word Passover. Right? And so they would, they would sacrifice the lambs. They would take the blood of the lambs and the goats, and they would put it on the doorpost, the lambs, not the goats. They would take and put uh, the, the, on, on the three corners of the, of the doorpost. And when the death angel would come, he would pass over, hence where you get the word Passover. Now, let me give you some, some parallels to Passover in Jesus. Is this is the Passover lamb was sacrificed at 9 a.m. This is how Passover would work. It would, they would sacrifice the lamb in the Old Testament, and then the lamb was put in the oven at 3 p.m. And they would put that lamb in the oven, and then the sacrifice would cover their sins. It didn't remove it, it just covered it. And so that's what they were celebrating. So Passover represented salvation to the people, is what they were remembering. And so Good Friday, when Jesus was arrested, the day that he died and, and, and was crucified, Good Friday, excuse me, Thursday he was arrested, Friday he died on the cross, was Passover. And, the, and, and it's crazy the parallel that in the Old Testament, it was 9 a.m. Passover lamb, the lamb was put in the oven. And when Jesus, remember, he came to fulfill it. So Jesus was sacrificed at 9 a.m., this is crazy how parallel this is. The, the nails went into his hand, and he was sacrificed at 9 a.m. Jesus was put in the tomb at 3 p.m. So like the lamb put into the oven, Jesus was put into the tomb at 3 p.m. And here's the great thing about Jesus is that the lamb in the Old Testament covered our sins, but the lamb in the New Testament was sacrificed to remove our sins. Come on, somebody. So when we celebrate Passover, we think about Passover, we think about salvation. Now, you have to understand, this, this is a standalone moment. You can't add, add anything to Passover to get your sins forgiven. Salvation is, is the one. So this is a day that is a standalone day, and you can't do anything within it to add to it to make it better. Ephesians, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In other words, salvation is the starting point. Jesus came to give us a picture of freedom. He came to give us a picture of salvation. Again, he's coming to fulfill the Old Testament. And in doing that at Passover, it's celebrating, he's talking about salvation. It is the gift of of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So there's no works required with salvation, just a free gift. Come on, somebody. The second holiday is Pentecost. The the second holiday is Pentecost. And the word pente is the word five, and the word costi means to the 10th power. So the word Pentecost means 50. Not fire. Come on, somebody. It means 50. That's all it means. The word Pentecost means 50. So we don't have to make it weird. It just means 50. And so what they're doing is they're celebrating the law given on Mount Sinai. This is what they do in this holiday. So they they celebrate the law given on Mount Sinai back at the Ten Commandments. You guys remember the movie? The fire, and was it Charleston Heston and the Ten Commandments and the beard, and he's crushing it. And it's the Ten Commandments, and when, when it happened on Mount Sinai, and that's what they're celebrating at the, at, the, at the holiday of Pentecost. Now, here's the parallel. In the Old Testament, a cloud descended with loud noise and fire on Mount Sinai. Then uh, it also is the moment when God wrote his law on tablets of stone. He, took the, he wrote it on tablets of stone and, 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 and gave it to the people. Now, while Moses was getting the revelation, there was a fool down at the bottom called Aaron. And Aaron was down there, and he started worshiping a golden calf. How dumb can you be? Now, how, that means you can be close to God and just be stupid. Come on, somebody. That they were, they, he was watching the fire and the, and the stuff happen on Mount Sinai. And he's down there like, well, I don't know what they're doing up there. Let's build a calf and let's worship him. No, Aaron was a weak leader, and he believed the people. Anyway, long story. So what happened, though, on that day was 3,000 people died as a result. 3,000 people died as a result of worshiping the golden calf and turning away from the Lord. Now, that's the Old Testament. Now, when they celebrate Pentecost in the New Testament, what they're celebrating is that the Holy Spirit descended with a loud sound and fire in Acts chapter 2. A lot of dramatics happen in Acts chapter 2. He told them, go, wait, Holy Spirit's coming. Second thing was God didn't write it on tablets of heart. God wrote his law on their hearts. He said, we don't no longer write it on tablets of stone, but we write it upon the heart. So the word of God, uh, Pentecost, is about God writing the law on our hearts. And then 3,000 people died in the Old Testament uh, uh, celebrating the event of Mount Sinai. But in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people said yes to Jesus on that day. Out Out of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, verse 33 through 5 says, after his suffering... He presented himself to them and gave more convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse number 8 says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what's Pentecost about? Pentecost is about power to make a difference. That's what it's about. Pentecost is about power to make a difference. God called his church to be a group of people that were not contained to four walls, but were meant to go forth into all the world and share the good news of Jesus. That anybody that would believe, listen, you can't save nobody. The Holy Spirit draws people into that place of repentance. It's the Holy Spirit, and when you, when you, when you forfeit the opportunity to share him, when you forfeit the opportunity to be used by God, you're really saying, Holy Spirit, I don't trust you, I trust myself. God wants you to trust him. God wants you to trust the Holy Spirit. God wants you to live supernaturally, naturally, that when you're at a restaurant and the Holy Spirit says, this woman is in trouble, she's a single mom, give her the biggest tip that you've ever given and she's ever received. Some of you'd be like, no, that's the devil. Listen to me though, that's what, but it would change her life to know how much Jesus loves her. But listen, he needs vessels that listen to the Holy Spirit that are not spirit weird, but supernaturally natural in a way where you don't gotta say, thus saith the Lord. I guard myself against people that says God said this and God said that all the time. 
yeah, God said this and God said that. Listen, if it's God, I don't have to tell you, thus saith the Lord. I don't have to be at the restaurant and be like, thus saith the Lord. (laughs) This is what the Bible says to you, young lady. (laughs) No, I don't have to say that. I can ask her a simple question. How's your day going? Uh, Like right away. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's in the moment. Learn to be supernaturally, naturally. And you people that are reasoners, come on. You people that think a lot (laughs) and reason everything, you can't walk with the Holy Spirit and reason because he's going to get past your reasoning and ask you to do things that you can't do on your own that you can't reason why you're doing it. But if you live a life that's crucified in Christ, it's not about you anyway, so you obey the voice. Right? And so the, the third holiday is the tabernacle holiday, tabernacles. Jewish people also call it the Feast of Trumpets. But this, this is representing the second coming of Jesus. He's coming back. Come on, somebody. He was saying about it this morning. He's coming back. Can you, hey, come on. He's coming back. And this is what the tabernacles represent. And so here's kind of the picture is the tabernacle was a portable house. Come on, man. It was the first portable church. God invented portable church. They went everywhere, right? And so what happened, though, is what you have to understand is in the Old Testament, under the, under the tabernacle, is they were wondering, the people of Israel, they, they had the tabernacle and they would move it. Uh, David's was more pick up and move it. But they were wandering and living, living in temporary huts. This was a characteristic of the people of Israel, of the nation, the Hebrew nation, is they were wandering and living in temporary huts. They were brought to their final home, and so what happened was is they, they, they were wandering for a long time, and then finally they crossed over and they entered their promised land, which would be their home. And then they celebrated it during harvest season. Harvest or the, the, the Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated during the harvest season. Now, again, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so the tabernacles were fulfilled this way, is that we have to understand, just like the children of Israel, that we're living on this temporary earth. You guys know you're just wondering? We're just living in a temporary earth. We're portable. We're, 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 not, we're not meant to stay here forever. Thank you, Jesus. But, they, but, then, but then we will be brought to our final home, which is in heaven. Just like the children, they were brought to their promised land. And, and this is what they would celebrate with the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Trumpets. That we'll be brought to our final home. And then finally, there's going to be a great harvest of people. <clears throat> that before he comes back, there's going to be an influx of the harvest of people. And people's like, well, it's just getting darker. It's supposed to. It's going to get darker because there's people that need to know Jesus, and the only thing that can shine on the backdrop of darkness is light. Come on, somebody. And the Bible says that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So right before he comes back, there's going to be this great harvest of people, and I believe we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. I believe that this region is ripe for harvest. I believe that God is getting ready to raise up a church in this region that's going to reap the harvest. No shame. Man, just going to preach Jesus, share Jesus, love like Jesus did, uh, uh, give, give like Jesus gave, live in compassion like Jesus did. And they're going to see a picture of Jesus, and they're going to go, I want that Jesus. We're coming into that place. You're going to be at work one day, and somebody's going to go, tell me about this Jesus that you've been living for. And you're going to be like, what? You're going to be blown away that they're going to ask you why, because the end's coming near. He's coming back, and people are going to start to wonder who this Jesus is. Listen, don't let everything that's going on in this world deter you. Is that a phone? Oh, I thought it was the fire alarm. We're good. We're good. I was like, oh, God, the trumpet. And we're all still here. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> I was looking down to see if my pants were still on. <laughs> I'll give you $10 for that illustration, bro, by the way. Just <laughs> and so first, uh, first Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. 
Acts 2.12 says, amazed and perplexed. This is after the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. It says, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? There was a perplexed, there was something, what does this empowerment of the Holy Spirit mean in our lives? And I'm going to give you a couple things when it comes to the empowered church. Number one is this, how does the Holy Spirit empower the church? Is the Holy Spirit empowers you to live righteously. The Holy Spirit empowers you to live righteously. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is your position, but your flesh doesn't want you to live righteously. Your flesh wants to get in front of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to be your lead and guide, but you have to understand is that the Holy Spirit wants to lead and guide you, but your flesh wants to lead and guide you. The Bible says in Romans 8, 9, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit if the Spirit of God lives in you. Here's what I believe about these two uh, 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 moments is the Holy Spirit and the flesh. Let me tell you how to be led by one or the other. You ready? Whatever you give the most attention to is what you'll be led by. It's that simple. Well, I don't know about the works of the flesh. Yeah, well, you keep giving attention to the works of the flesh. That's what you're going to be led by. The appetites of the flesh, that's what you'll be led by. But if you give attention to his word, you give attention to worship, you give attention to your devotional life, and you keep your mind on him, guess what? That's what you'll be led by. You won't have any questions whether or not it's God or your flesh. You can look back through your time tablet and your calendar and go, what have I given my most attention to? That will tell you what you're being led by. Isaiah says it this way. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it. Listen to me, notice what he said, this is the way you walk you in it. God is going to give you the way to walk in things. He's He's going to lead and guide your steps. Here's what you have to understand. He's not going to do it for you. It says, the voice came from behind me. In other words, the Holy Spirit is what they, it's the, it's the terminology parakletos, it's the word for helper. It's the word for one called alongside to help. It's not the one called alongside to do it for you. He will empower you as you move. He will empower you as you walk. As you make a decision on Monday to be a witness, he will empower you to be a witness. When you make a decision to live righteously and stop looking at the stuff that nobody else knows you're looking at, he will empower you to overcome those things. Come on, somebody. That, that he, he, that's what he does. He doesn't do it for you. He wants you to step, and then he empowers you as you step. Number two is this. He will empower the church to live supernaturally. God never intended for his church to be naturally led. He intended his church to be Holy Spirit led. God didn't intend for you to live naturally. Listen, Jesus lived supernaturally. But notice what he said when he left in John chapter 15. He said it this way. He said, when I go... Greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. He told his disciples, you're going to do amazing works because I go to my Father. Why? Because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He, he called us to be supernatural. Listen, it doesn't have to be spooky. It doesn't have to be weird. It doesn't have to be a bunch of fanfare. Listen, he makes us supernaturally naturally. You don't know how many supernatural conversations I've had with you on Sunday morning that you didn't even know what was going on. How's your coffee? It's coffee. And, and then the Holy Spirit just starts saying, so how's your week? And I can just see it start to happen in your life. You ask the right question. The Holy Spirit uses me in questions. Some of you are going to be like, I'm going to avoid that man at all costs. And if he starts asking questions, I know what he's asking. He's hearing something. No, I just believe that that's how he uses me. It's not overt. It's not like, Holy Spirit all over you. Take it. No. It's very just, hey. How's your dad doing? Right? Just very, just whatever the Spirit of the Lord asked me to say. And I just do it naturally. Right? He wants us to be natural. Why? Because there is a world that doesn't understand your experience. You know, we had somebody, well, I won't go into that. We'll keep moving. It, it, again, it, it just needs to be, because here's why it needs to be supernatural in life. It's because he still does miracles. He still opens doors that you couldn't. He still leads you into blessing. He still heals people physically, mentally, and emotionally. He still does supernatural things in your life. Acts chapter 10, verse 30 says, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. There should be some stuff following you if God is with you. There should be some stuff happening around you if God is with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. 
And I really believe this, the greatest demonstration of the Spirit's power is salvation. Can we celebrate that we've had somebody say yes to Jesus every week since Easter? Come on, somebody. Ever since Easter, somebody said yes to Christ at our church. Can we celebrate the people that are being baptized, that were baptized a few weeks ago? Can we celebrate that? The greatest moment when you are packing up your stuff to get ready to go eat at Cracker Barrel is when people are making decisions. It's the most spiritually charged moment in our services. And you're like, I got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. You got the gift card? We're going to go to Dickie's and get barbecue. Come on, somebody. They got free ice cream and the kids eat free. Let's get out of here. Amen. As much as I love all that, the most spiritually charged moment when demons are active in our service, if you will, when the supernatural is happening the most is when somebody in this room is on the verge of life or death. This is not a casual moment. And if our altars are ever gonna turn into hundreds of people, we have to understand this as the church, that you're saved in this moment when I'm about to ask somebody to say yes, you're supposed to be praying. You're not supposed to be spectating. You're supposed to be praying. If you understand that the Holy Spirit is moving and he is working, you're supposed to be praying that the Holy Spirit empowers us to live supernaturally so that your faith will not rest in wisdom of men, but in God's power. Number three is this, and we'll close. The Holy Spirit empowers me to live on mission. He not only wants us to live supernaturally and live righteously, but he wants us to live on mission. First Thessalonians 1, 5 says, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, listen to this, and with deep conviction. I believe mission has to do with deep conviction. God told him, you're going to be witnesses of me. That's the only thing he told him. He said, listen, you're going to be in due with power and you're going to be my witness. The word witness is the word martyr. He said, you'll die for me. That's what he told him. What about us? Where does that apply to us? Like we're going to die for Jesus tomorrow when we go to Kroger? No, I believe how it applies to us. It might get that, to that point, but listen to me for just a minute. Here's what it means. The Bible says that our will is supposed to be crucified with Christ, that we are dead, no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So when we're at a God moment, do we live or do we die? The response is in yes or no in that moment. What do you do with those God moments? When you're on mission and you're supposed to be a witness for him, What do we do with those God moments? The Bible says that we we are to walk with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction that I'm on a mission. I'm passing through this place. I'm wandering on through it. There's a home called heaven that I'm going to. And in the meantime, I want to take as many folks as I can with me. It's not just working a job. It's not, that's your ministry. Sean, you're a principal over a bunch of people, right? What do you do? What's your, what? Superintendent. That's your ministry. This isn't your ministry, that's your ministry. Whatever you do for an occupation, it's not your occupation, it's your ministry. And in your ministry, the Holy Spirit is gonna use you in your ministry. You call it work, God calls it ministry. And when you go to ministry on Monday, the Holy Spirit is there with you and he's leading, guiding you through conversations when you're sitting in a board meeting. And you know there's a Judas around the table. Holy Spirit's gonna say, marked, amen. I love those moments. Like when the Holy Spirit just tells you, no, that's the wrong person. They're affecting the team. There's toxicity in the team, right? And the Holy Spirit talks to you and then you can either heal it or ask it to leave, right? But I'm taking those real life examples because I want you to move it out of spooky and move it into natural. Yet it's supernatural and it's that you're living on mission for him and the mission is that people would come to know him as Lord and Savior. Let's close our eyes this morning, bow our heads. I wanna read you one last statement. Being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. The Holy Spirit is not designed for us to be better than another church, better than the Baptist, better than the Presbyterian. We got the Holy Spirit in our life. But man, mm, burn me something this morning. Listen, here, listen, listen, listen. Lifestyle speaks when it comes to whether or not you're really living by the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. He says this, he says, Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. That we can't live life without the Holy Spirit. 
that he wants to lead and guide us. He wants us to live righteously. And so today, as we celebrate Pentecost and Memorial Day weekend, maybe in this room today, you say, Pastor, I've never made Jesus the Lord of my life. Or maybe you once did and you walked away from God and you're not living righteously and you're backslid. You're like Luke 15 person. That's living in that place where you're like the prodigal son. Living in that place, you've spent all you had, you've done all you know to do, and you're just living wild right now. Your father's beckoning you to come home. He wants you to come home, but it's your decision. And I believe today, as you make that step, the Holy Spirit will make that step with you. And today, if you say yes to Christ, it's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to come, and he's going to make you a brand new person. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, old things will pass away and all things will become new. You will become a brand new person. God is not going to fix you. He's going to make you again. He's not going to take all your old parts and make it into something new. No, he's going to, he's going to kill, if you will, those things in your life. And he wants you to come into resurrection life. And so if you're in this room, or if you're watching online today and you say, pastor, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I've walked away or I've never made Jesus the Lord of my life. Today's your day. And you say, that's me. We do me a favor. We just slip up your hand. I want to pray for you today. You say, that's me. I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life today. Can we all pray this prayer this morning with me? Say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I ask you to come into my heart, make me a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for transforming me. May the Holy Spirit make me a brand new person today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Can we give the Lord a big hand clap today? Somebody said yes to Christ this morning. Well, you guys have an amazing Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Just so you know, because we're coming into summer this week only, uh, next couple weeks, but today we don't have to break anything down. Praise the Lord. We get to leave everything up. So enjoy your weekend. We love you guys. Have a great weekend. Hello, I'm Sarah, and I want to say thank you for